Thanks for coming. I uh, hope you're all doing well today. Um, my name is Jennifer Jett. I'm the moderator of the talk today, and I'm also the first vice president here at the FCC. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first, please be sure to silence your phones. Um, I also wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. Uh, things are in full swing here, and we have a lot of great events coming up, um, including tonight. Uh, we have a, our club screening of a documentary called Waking the Sleeping Grape. This is about the wine industry in China. And uh, that event will feature uh, the, the director and executive producer of the film, who is also a Beijing-based um, wine consultant. Um, and I believe there will be Chinese wines on hand to try as well, if you'd like to learn more about uh, wine developments there. Uh, so that's tonight. Um, and then this Thursday, we have another book talk um, at lunchtime by James Zimmerman, a Beijing-based lawyer who has written a really fascinating book uh, called The Peking Express. It's about a 1923 train robbery um, and hostage crisis, basically, that captured world attention. Um, and that is on Thursday. Um, I also wanted to remind you that we have an election underway here at the FCC, so for our members in the audience, if you haven't voted yet, the deadline to do that is tomorrow at 3 p.m. Uh, you should have received your ballot in the mail, uh, but since you're here anyway, you could also go to the front desk downstairs and ask for a, a, another ballot, and you can find all the candidate bios and statements uh, on the FCC website. So please remember to vote before 3 p.m. tomorrow. The ballot box is downstairs. Um, all right, so today uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Daniel Bell here to speak with us about his book. Um, Daniel is a Confucian scholar who recently moved to Hong Kong where he is chair of political theory in the faculty of law at HKU. Uh, but the reason we're here today is to talk about his experience at Shandong University where he was the first foreign dean of a political science faculty in the history of mainland China. And he talks about his experiences in his new book, The Dean of Shandong, Confessions of a Minor Bureaucrat at a Chinese University. And this is also his first uh, event uh, connected to this book anywhere, so we're very pleased to have his first book talk here. Um, and I will just jump right into questions, and we'll also take some questions from the audience at the end. Um, so to start off with, could you tell us a little bit about um, uh, the background of this book uh, and how, what your job was and how you came to be the dean of the faculty. Okay, well thank you very much. I should first thank the FCC. As, as Jennifer mentioned, it's my first talk. All my previous talks were canceled, mainly for political reasons, some of which are related to China, but actually we're all supposed to be in Israel at this point, but they said don't come, there's a civil war, so we had to cancel those talks. Anyway, um, so, well, <coughs> I had been working on Confucianism for um, several, well, for a long time, and then Sh Shandong province is the home culture of Confucianism, and they were building a new campus in Qingdao. I don't know if any of you have been to Qingdao, it's, it's very beautiful. And the, it was a 76th generation descendant of Confucius, the surname is Kong, because in Chinese, you know, Confucius is Kong. And he said, you, you can come here, and we can build up a new faculty, and we can promote Confucianism throughout the university. And it's the leading university in a province of 100 million people. So the students are great, I, I would say. Before I taught at Tsinghua, I would say at least as good. And, and, then, and then you can, um, and also you can help us internationalize. So then, um, and, uh, but when he first invited me, there was, it was just an empty field. It was, it, was, it was more than 10 years ago. And he says, we're going to have a university here. I said, OK, very interesting. Let's talk again in a few years. Sure enough, in a few years, beautiful new campus. I mean, all, you can only do that in China, right? I'm from Canada, where it, it would be inconceivable. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and I was honored to, to be offered this post, yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, your expectations for this job versus uh, the, the reality or your actual experience of it? So this book is, um, I, I read lots of political books, and my favorite ones are the history of failures. Like there's a fellow Canadian, Michael Ignatieff, he wrote a book about how he failed as a, a political leader in Canada. I thought that was his best book. So yeah, I mean, it didn't always go as planned. Um, the, the internationalization part did not succeed, mainly because of COVID, which was 
um, uh, unexpected, obviously, and I had to spend most of the time trying to just maintain the status quo instead of expanding as an, in, as an international. I mean, that's one thing that in, even at the you know, provincial universities in China are very keen on inter internationalization. I mean, academics love it, you know, and so, so do the students. And I, w I wanted to give more opportunities for students to go abroad and, and teachers and so on. Um, but because of COVID, that obviously uh, was brought to a sudden halt. And the Confucian part was a bit more complicated because although Shandong is home ground of Confucianism, but not everybody supports Confucianism. So we had, but finally I realized it's through hiring teachers who are um, strongly committed to Confucian. That's the way, that's the way to do it as opposed to, to doing it myself. And also I thought that in, a, in Chinese, like if you say Yuan Zhang, you know, which means Dean, it's, it sounds, wow, so grand. And I, so I thought I would have a lot of power that corresponds to the name. But I, but I was a little bit surprised that when I first started, I learned this collective leadership with, with three vice deans and three party secretaries, and everything had to be decided as a matter of consensus. So in the collective leadership decision-making process, it was very open, very critical, um, but it took a long time to achieve consensus. That's a bit why I'm not sure, if, you know, in, at the highest levels, I'm still a little bit optimistic that there's collective leadership, but I guess it's a separate point. We don't know what goes on, but given my own experience, I suspect that it's, it's quite open uh, and critical uh, debates among those collective leaders. But another thing that surprised me, I must confess, is, and there's a chapter in there called The Communist Comeback, I didn't expect people's commitment to Marxism to be serious. I thought a lot of people pay lip service to Marxism, but no, I mean, they had, I mean, I was, I, sorry, I'm a bit drifting a little bit. I, I, was, I did my graduate work at Oxford, and, my, and the professor there was G.A. Cohen, who was a leading Marxist theorist. So I had actually been trained in Marxist theory before I came to China. And they really had good knowledge of Marxist theory and a strong commitment to moving towards this communist ideal where advanced machinery does the necessary work, and then humans are free to realize their creative talents. And I was surprised at, and, and there's, I recount one incident there where I gave a, a talk representing the faculty to the whole university, and before the talk, you had to, you had to do a few, you know, um, like pay lip service, I guess, to you know the leaders and to this the ruling organization and so on. I said, look, it's very uncomfortable for me to do that. I'm not sure I could do it. But what I did say is, look, I'm not yet a party member, but I'm committed to communist ideals. And wow, everybody broke out clapping. I was, I was really surprised. So there is that commitment. This Marxist comeback, it's serious, but not necessarily in a bad way. I know I'm, communism sounds really bad if you're kind of, you know, uh, you know in, 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 for example, in right-wing circles in the US. But co if communism means reducing gap between rich and poor, you know, having more environmental sustainability, uh, having advanced technology that does socially necessary work so humans are free to realize their creative talents. That's a great thing, you know, and yeah. Um, sort of continuing down that path, uh, previously you wrote a book, I think it's China's New Confucianism uh, from 20, 2008, um, where you argued that Confucianism, if I'm characterizing this correctly, um, was in the process of supplanting Marxism in China. And or we, you know, we've all seen what's happened in the last Ten years or so, um, and I was curious what you think about the relationship between uh, Confucianism and Marxism or communism now in China under Xi Jinping, and where where things might go from here. That's a hard. I know question. it's a big question. <laughs> no, no, not big. It's, it's hard to answer. In the, um, but I mean, there is this Confucian comeback has also been going on for several decades, both at the highest levels where there's commitment to reviving the best of Chinese culture, and Confucianism is a dominant political tradition in China's past. We know in the 20th century it was severely, you know, uh, marginalized, and if, if uh, um, and in Shandong province in particular, people have deep pride in the Confucian heritage, um, and, and it influences people's lived uh, experience. I mean, I mentioned there the, the banquets, you know, which are heavily ritualized. The seating arrangements are hierarchical. Um, 
and then the drinking is, you know, is also kind of controlled and ritualized. Um, but the aim is to provide, a, a, to use kind of Western language, a sense of community among the participants. And so I think that's, that's always uh, going to be there. And some issues like um, the Qingming Festival, um, which is in, in April every year, to, as kind of a, a grave to provide, to worship your ancestors, um, that came at the, the ground level. There was millions and millions taking the day off, and then finally the government said, fine, let's just make it a national holiday. So it is being revived, and, in, and shortly after President Xi assumed power, he went to Chufu, which is the kind of literally ground zero for Confucianism, and he was handed two books about Confucianism, and he says, yes, I will study this seriously. At that point, many of us thought, oh, oh this is going to be a serious turning point here where Confucianism really might replace Marxism, but now I think they're both going to um, be there for the foreseeable future. And there's substantial overlap. Like one thing about the Confucian tradition is that it's, al it's always emphasized that the first obligation of government is to alleviate, is, is to provide basic material necessities for people or to alleviate poverty because it was assumed that if people are constantly struggling for material necessities, it's hard for them to be moral, right? I mean, you can't care about other people if you're spending all your time just making enough money trying just to survive. Um, so China has the longest history of any government that established a strong bureaucracy with the explicit aim of providing basic material necessities for people. I think that's one reason why socialism kind of resonated with this older Confucian tradition. So I think you're going to see both of those um, dominant value systems having heavy influence in China's political future. I mean, as you mentioned in my earlier book, I thought that Confucianism might replace um, communism, but now I, I, I think that was just silly, yeah. Um, before I forget, I wanted to ask you about uh, the cover of your book, um, because are these emoji on here? Uh, can you tell us about the cover and, and uh, the story behind that? Well, um, so my, what I did, there's this new AI called DALL, D-A-L-L dash E, and, it, and if you provide, give it some prompts, it could provide some beautiful graphic designs. So I tried to do that, and it came up with many designs, and I sent them to my print center. I says, please, let's use one of these. And he says, he just sent me a message. He's saying, luckily, our graphic designers at Prince Universe Press will not lose their jobs. He wasn't very happy with them. And they came up with this. I mean, it's really a clever idea. So. Each emoji represents a theme in, in one chapter in the book, and, and it's quite beautiful and, and cute. And there's a chapter on, it's called a critique of cuteness. Um, and I thought, wow. And actually many, uh, I, get, I get emails regularly just praising the cover. And I should mention that my father was a journalist and a writer, but at the end of his life, he became a secondhand bookseller. And he always used to tell me, you can judge a book by its cover, you know? So <laughs> I can't take responsibility for the cover, but I do think it's a beautiful cover. Yeah. And I think, I think one thing you mentioned in the book, uh, as, uh, as dean at Shandong University, you had to get really conversant in emoji in your chat conversations no. and the difference between that and you know, communication at Western University. Or even Hong Kong. I'm shocked that my, I mean, I have my colleague there, Marco, we don't use emojis when we exchange emails. I'm really disappointed. I mean, because <laughs> it does, it softens the communication, you know? If you want to make a bureaucratic point and, or, or even just, it, it, just, it, if you, it, it, it softens it if you send a cute emoji. But I do recount stories of sending the wrong emoji, mm -hmm. which, which can lead to problems, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you give an example? Well, um, so I thought, that the shit emoji represented chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and I sent that to one of my elderly colleagues. And, that, and it's hard to explain, right? I mean, in speech, you can make a faux pas, and then you say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. But if you send the wrong emoji, it's hard to take it back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's very much a double-edged sword. Um, so I wanted to broaden things out a little bit um, because in, in the book and in your past work, you talk about sort of the advantages of, of political meritocracy and, and the difference between the ideal that, that China could be striving for and the actual reality. Um, and you also talk a lot about Western perceptions of China. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about was, uh, well, first of all, 
she has been very active diplomatically recently and his activities have been drawing a lot of attention in the West. What do you see as China's ambitions for the international order and its role in that order? Well, I mean, so I, the, the idea that China wants to reject the previous order and replace it with something new, I mean, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, China has benefited from the global order and, and of course it wants to change it a little bit so that it, so that it's no longer dominated by Western powers. I mean, that's kind of, you know, what's wrong with that? Um, and so I, I, this whole, de, you know, this way of structuring the debate of democracy versus autocracy is, is really, I think, just mislabeling, you know, you have to compare ideals with ideals, right? So you have to ask, what is the ideal in forming, in this case, the US? Okay, they're democracy. But is it a flawed democracy? Yeah, it's a deeply flawed democracy, highly imperfect democracy, okay. So what is China? Autocracy, is that what we call ourselves, autocracy? No, of course not, what do we call ourselves? Well, one idea is political meritocracy. We have a decades-long process to select public officials with above average ability and virtue. Does it work well? Well, not always. In fact, often things go terribly wrong, right? Corruption was way out of hand. So it's a highly imperfect political meritocracy. Let's compare ideals with ideals rather than just here we, you know, we have a, the, it, that, that, that's, that's one thing that informs this book. So what it, I mean, in, in the future, you know, China arguably will, will want to be a dominant power in East Asia. I mean, that's what, you know, that's to be expected. But it, it would do so ideally in a way that benefits the smaller powers, right? I'm from Canada and I don't, particularly appreciate US dominance, but I realize that it actually benefits Canada in many ways because the US can provide a security umbrella and Canada has more, so I should, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, has more to spend on social welfare so we can provide better ser well, services for us. And so fine, we won't criticize the US too much, you know. If China can move towards that model in East Asia with surrounding smaller countries, I think that would be a good thing in the future. Um, in, I think, much of your book uh, tends to push back against some of the dominant narratives against China, and you, you talk about, I think the word you use is uh, demonization of, of China and the Chinese Communist Party. And could you tell us a bit about sort of why you think it's important to counter those narratives and the, the demonization? Well, who does demonization benefit, right? I mean, okay, so let me first tell a story that's not in the book. I mean, when I, so I also taught at Schwarzman College at Tsinghua many years ago. I don't know if this is supposed to be, all, well, I'm just gonna say it anyway. So we went to um, Stephen Schwarzman's office in New York. This was more than 10 years ago. And he said, okay, things are okay now with China. And he goes, yeah, yeah. And he says, wait a few years, well, what do you mean? He says, US, we have lots of problems and we need an external enemy. China is, is gonna be our external enemy. That's why I wanna establish this program at Schwarzman College to train future leaders so that they have a better understanding of China. You know, that's part of what's going on. And who does de demonization benefit in China? I mean, you, the West or anybody can't change China, but what it can do is give excuses for certain you know, forces within the Chinese political system to do what they do that they would want to do otherwise, but now they have an external, you know, for enemy to blame. So, you know, when China joined the WTO, lots of painful reforms. We said, oh, sorry, we have to do it because we joined WTO. This demonization, who does it benefit? It benefits the paranoid, you know, security apparatus. You know, they say, well, look, we're surrounded by these military forces, uh, military bases. They're squeezing the Chinese economy. You know, don't, we can't have advanced chips anymore. Uh, obviously, they want to undermine China's development, so we need to have strength in the security apparatus. I mean, who does that benefit? Almost all the academics I work with want a much more open environment. You know, really, it's uh, that's why it's so upsetting when when I, you know, when I when I re read most of the dominant narrative. And sorry to say this, in the you know in the media, yeah, you know, outside of China, I should say in the West, yeah. Um, related question in the in the book, you talk about uh, Western media coverage of China and your evolving relationship with the Western media. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, I find the more I understand, the longer time I spend in China, the more I understand the details, the less I have, uh, I'm not criticizing anybody, but the less interest there is in my views. I mean, it's so weird, right? 
I mean, when I first arrived in China, wow, this kind of cute little Canadian teaching at Tsinghua, they would all come and interview me, film me, and so on. I'm not this, maybe this is gonna sound, I'm not saying this is out of vanity, but it's just a peculiar phenomenon. It's not just me, you know, that any, maybe they think that these people have gone native, so they won't provide balanced views anymore. But um, it's a little bit odd, you know, that they would, you know, the people who are, uh, whose views are taken seriously tend to be those who are not, you know, don't have detailed knowledge of what's happening in China. Um, and I think especially because it's been so difficult to get into China the last few years. For oh, sure, yeah, of course. Of course I favor open, you know, all journalists should come to China. And as, as I mentioned in the book during COVID, the one ex journalist who was there from New York Times, Keith Bradshaw, I mean, he's great, you know, such detailed knowledge. So of course we should have, um, you know, China should be more open, not just to journalists, but, you know, to intellectuals and academics and, you know, anybody who wants to learn and engage with China. Yeah. Um, so, yeah I'm, not, I'm not just saying it's only the fault of the West. Yeah. And going back to your experience in academia there, um, the, you know, there have been a lot of reports about growing censorship in mainland China and suppression of Western influence in schools. Uh, in, in your experience, is that getting worse or in, in what ways is it better than you would expect and how, how are people in academia feeling these days? So yeah, I mean, it is getting worse. There's increasing constraints on academic freedom and I detail that in the book. Um, but is there a reason to be pessimistic for the long term? And as you know, in the book, I also draw on my Singapore experience. My first job was in Singapore, 91 to 94, and that was really serious constraints on academic freedom. You know, I, the head of department, you know, who was an MP for the ruling party said, you can't teach Mill on liberty, you can't teach, you know, Mill subjection of women and so on. No feminism for like what, one year, first year student. It was really crude and eventually, and even like, it's hard to believe in those days, like there was a guy, my colleague Christopher Lingle, who wrote an article in the, and then it was the IHT, International Health Tribune, saying that China's economic growth rates were slightly exaggerated. And because of that, he was like forced to leave the country, you know? And look what happened in Singapore. 15 years later, 20 years later, much more open environment. Academic freedom, basically fine. A few little red lines, you know, don't criticize the character of leaders in a very harsh way, fine. You know, don't stir up religious sensibilities. Okay, okay. The rest of that, Singapore's beautiful, I mean, of course, always problems, but in terms of academic freedom, so much progress. I do think that China may move in this Singaporean direction in the next few decades. Why do I think that? Uh, sorry, I thought this, I should. <laughs> that's my, that's my next question. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't ask it. Um, but anyway, um, well, okay, so there's two reasons why there's constraints on academic freedom. Let's just say general increase in repression in China, okay? One is this demonization in the, by the West, which strengthens these paranoid forces in the security apparatus. And two, I think, is lots of things had to be accomplished when President Xi assumed power that were you know, one is the corruption really became out of control. Environment, disaster, you know, huge gap between rich and poor. So he had to tackle vested, he, not just he, whoever was in power, it doesn't matter. You know, had to tackle vested interests, which means many enemies in the political system, which makes the top leaders more paranoid, legitimately so, you know. But now the environment is doing much better. Corruption, I think, is slowly getting under control. If the gap between rich and poor re reduces, eventually the leaders can relax a little bit. If that happens, and if the West demonization of China decreases, and also there's a sense of pride in, among you know, the, the new generation. This is what happened in Singapore too. In Singapore now is there, the leaders worry that we don't have a sense of national pride, and if we loosen up a bit, you know, things could easily go, go wrong. But Singapore, 20 years later, maybe there, who, people from Singapore here could correct me, there's a stronger sense of national identity, so leaders could be more secure. Same thing is happening in China. The younger generation is much more secure in, in its national identity and pride, which actually is a reason why things might loosen up in the future. So that's my uh, humble and, per, look, I've been wrong so many times, so please take what I say about the future with a grain of salt, yeah. Um. I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, as you said, you're from Canada and we don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about Canada. So um, 
I wanted to ask you a bit about what's happening right now in Canada-China relations and, and how it compares to perhaps US-China relations and where you think that might be going. It's a disaster. I'm really embarrassed. I mean, you know, of course I realized when um, things went wrong because of, you know, Hmong and the two Michaels, and, but I thought once that was resolved that things would improve a little bit, but it's only getting worse. I'm, and I, sometimes I watch the national news and the first item is about China's like infiltration and it really, it scares a lot of like Chinese Americans. There's a, there's a kind of racist undertone which, which is really, really worrisome. And Canada has this history, you know, of, a, of a, you know, discrimination against, uh, you know, the Chinese immigrants and it's really ugly. Some of the, like there's one senator in, 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 in Canada, you know, Senator Wu who's criticizing this and, but it's really worry. I mean, uh, the current prime minister's father used to be great on, I mean, on, on China. He, 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 you know, he came here in 1960s, rode a motorcycle throughout China, and he had a more sympathetic and balanced view. But now, I mean, Canada's like a, like, just sorry to say this, like a vassal of the United States. So embarrassing. Sorry if I sound. Uh, well, maybe we have some Canadians in the audience who have uh, other thoughts to add. Um, let's uh, open it up to questions. Um, Please uh, identify yourself and your organization, if any, and, and we'll start over here. Uh, my name is Mark Erder. Um, you glided over at the beginning of the talk your appointment as dean. Can you talk a little bit more personally about how that happened? Because that seemed to be the big wow moment in your book, that you're the first ever foreign dean of a university in China. And I'd just be interested in your take on why you got that appointment. So it really was the strong support of the party secretary of the Qingdao campus of Shandong University, who um, he, he's, he's a real, um, very open-minded. And, and, he, and he thought that I, I would help to Promote both promote Confucian. I mean, it sounds odd. It's double. Both promote Confucianism and it helped to internationalize the university. And he never put pressure on me to do this or that. In fact, he became a close confidant. Um, it's it's really because of him. And he made many. I don't describe too much detail in, in, in the book, but I've, I, it took a few years because initially, as mentioned, when I went there, there was just an empty field, you know. But eventually, I met him many times, and we became close friends. And, and to the point that he, we, we were, you know, in Chinese, say, Germer, you know, and I just couldn't say no. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm honor, I'm, I was honored to be asked, actually. Yeah. Um, other, other questions? Uh, yes. Thank you, and thank you, Professor, for a very interesting sharing of insights. Yeah. My name is Chia. I'm from uh, Value Partners. I'm just interested now, now that you have relocated to Hong Kong, What's your perception, what's your take on Hong Kong's political, social environment? And what, is the, what do you think may be the perception of many mainland Chinese people towards the status of Hong Kong? Thank you. Well, so one of my things is that I really want to refrain from judgment unless I have detailed local knowledge. And so I've only been here six months. That said, I did spend eight years here between 1996 and 2003. So I do see many changes. Like, and many of them positive, right? Less pollution, much better music scene. You know, my son is a musician. Um, better restaurants. In the past, we had to go to Shenzhen to have good non-Cantonese food. Um, and of course, the the you know the political atmosphere has changed a bit. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, we know it's more restrictions. But when I was here. In, many years ago, there was like open discrimination, you know, against like mainland Chinese, you know. This is embarrassing. Like I was given a flat at the University of Hong Kong because I was from Canada, whereas those who were from um, mainland China couldn't, couldn't, were not eligible for flats. You know, that was all changed after the handover. So I see a lot of positive things. And, the, and one thing we do have to value here is press freedom, academic freedom, it's much, much better than mainland China. I hope we can, you know, flourish, continue to flourish in that respect. Mm. Um, yes. 
Hi, thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, I'm Rachel Bellington. I'm a consultant for Canada. Oh. So first of all, I have to take Sorry, exception I to the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, have to take uh, exception, strong objections to the characterization of Canada as a vassal state, but we'll save that discussion for another day. You and I can get together and, and duke it out. But um, you and I met uh, several years ago, I think, when you were at Tsinghua. I was at the embassy in Beijing at the time, so I'm here now. Um, but uh, my question actually comes to uh, the issue of student, student flows between China and other countries globally. And I'm curious to know kind of what you were seeing uh, before your, your move here to Hong Kong in terms of, uh, notwithstanding COVID, Chinese students going overseas, um, openness on the part of institutions or government to allowing those students to go overseas and pursue their degrees, kind of what you see the trends there, being like and, and how you view that whole issue. I mean, I, I worry that those numbers are diminishing from some perspectives and that it's not a positive development in terms of just trying to increase, I think, a, a, you know, a, a more um, what informed, uh, nuanced understanding globally of what China is like domestically, where the problems are, but where the, where the progress is too. Uh, so just interested in your perspectives on student flows internationally. Thanks. So, well, based on my own experience, there was great openness towards international exchanges. And at Shandong University, part of my mission was to send students abroad for at least a year, um, including to Canada. And, and there was, you know, on my side, on our side, it was, it was fine. Um, but as mentioned, that all came to an end because of COVID. So will it come back? I think so, but it, it, might, it may take a while. That said, I mean, I do want to say one thing is that, you know, there's much more openness to learning about China from other countries in the global south. So at, at Shandong University, we, most of our overseas students were, f were not from the west, they were from the global south. And they were genuinely curious about learning from China, you know, whereas if you, sorry, I, I don't mean to criticize my fellow Canadians, but, you know, typically there was a view, you know, we have the right way and you guys are kind of you know, it, the learning wasn't felt to be mutual as much. I mean, there has to be an approach where if you go, if you go to China or if you, you know, you, you, it should be willingness to, to learn. I mean, it, was, it seems so obvious, but somehow my own, you know, impression is that the students from the global south were much more open to engaging and to learning from China and, and vice versa. We're, yeah, even at Schwarzman College, I must say, where I taught for many years, the students from like the US and Canada were just lecturing all the time. It's so irritating, you know. Um, let's go in the, in the back, uh, William, and then we'll come up back here. Hi, uh, thanks, William. I'm a Singaporean from uh, South China Morning Post. Oh, hello. So, uh, no, uh, uh, we can di agree to disagree about what you said about Singapore. Okay. Right? <laughs> Tell me where you disagree. I'm curious. Largely, I agree with you. Yeah, uh, the, the country has made tremendous progress in its tolerance. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, there are, there are, there are more people, are st there are still people hoping it could have uh, progressed further. But obviously, being a pragmatic, conservative uh, country, it had chosen to manage its pace of uh, evolution. So, yeah, it, it's just a matter of pace, okay. right? Uh, one comment, one question. Um, just now you were talking about uh, communism and uh, Confucianism. Uh, I think within the party, they are still playing very strong on the communism front because anyway, that's the flag they have to bury. But uh, she and his comrades obviously, obviously find out that uh, the Western communist, the, the communism anyway is from the West. It doesn't quite gel with China's own culture per se. So uh, there are only 96 million party members that they, they can cycle using uh, communism. So what to do with the rest of 1.4 billion people? So that's what they decided to go back to the traditional Chinese values per se to to use that to harness the whole country together. That's just one comment. But uh, recently, she has been talking so much about uh, uh, he he has just written a new word called global 
civilization initiative, which is, I think this is like third pillar in his huge uh, uh, diplomatic thoughts, which I'm still trying to figure out what it is. But uh, do you think China government will, in, in one day, they'll be finding out a way to finally build a bridge between their own their own narratives and the Western narratives, which seems now it's a mission impossible, where the Chinese have been stressing about their own culture and century of humiliation, blah, blah, blah. But the West has been talking about you are just um, autocracy, you, know, you, you need to, to move to the democracy side. Is there any way that they can ever build the bridge? That's just... Yeah, I mean, so... I think we shouldn't just worry about the West. I mean, that's why China now is reaching out to other countries, especially in the global south. Of course, the West, I mean, if there's, re if there's so it seems so obvious that global challenges like climate change, you know, regulation of nuclear weapons, dealing with global pandemics, and, and now the threat, existential threat of AI requires global collaboration, especially between the world's two greatest powers. And, at some point, things have to get worse for, 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 I guess, not just the West. I mean, it is China for both sides to realize that we need to collaborate on these issues and leave the rest aside. I mean, I'm not saying anything new here, um, but it, it, will, it will take something dramatically worse, I think, for both sides to realize that we need to come to the table and, and, and set aside our differences. I, didn't, I mean, I think China, part of its you know, success of, in the past was it's willing to learn from best practices abroad and including from, from the West. And I think there's still this learning attitude, but, but in the West, there's, sorry, it's gonna sound cr crude generalizations and I apologize, but you know, there's still this view that you know, we are the teacher and you guys have, are, are the you know, students and that has to change, yeah. Uh, we had a question here. <clears throat> Hello, Professor. Thank you for joining our lunch. Um, I'm named Houghton Lee, an FCC member. I just got your book, okay, so I don't think I'm qualified to comment on your book. I haven't read it yet, okay, but I'm sure it's with a good reading. But um, I, I just see your comment because I just read an article from uh, Financial Times I, uh, from April. I'm not sure Financial Times is regarded as friendly to China or not, but I get it from Mr. James Crabtree. I think he read your book, but I'm just making sure he didn't put the words in your mouth. But right? in his last paragraph, where after you hear say, you just said earlier that uh, now China have made is now when the top leadership in China feels confident of their achievement, okay, in uh, in, in building the country, then they may be be able to loosen a bit, yeah. and things will go into be a more more positive way or something like Singapore in a positive sense. Mm. But uh, this James, he, he said, okay, this Mr. Crabtree said, but there's something he does admit, that's me, uh, uh, Dr. Bell, okay. He said, uh, he said, you said, okay, I'm not sure whether you did say that. When I look at some of the things I wrote in the past, I realized that I was much too naive in thinking that China would move toward a more humane political society. Uh, and then, after, uh, and then uh, you say something like possibility of a return to Maoist-style personal dictatorship is possible. So, so as, you, uh, as he quoted you, I'm not sure whether you wrote this in your book, uh, how would you respond to this? Um, so it's, you should never ask authors to respond to book reviews because it's hard not to sound very defensive. Um, but uh, so, some, so this is probably from the introduction to the book where, uh, I mean, this is frankly to get published in the West. You have to begin by saying, you know, criticizing China for all these terrible things and then you can say what you really want to say. So part of, part of that is, actually, I hope my, they're not, anyway, so p part, of, part of what I wrote is written in that vein. I mean, of course it's partly true, but that's not my, my main point. I mean, my main point is that notwithstanding, you know, increased repression um, and, and, and other bad things going on, but there's still such humanity 
and humor in the system. And, and my book is, even though it's, it's pretty heavy, you know, going subjects, communism and so on, but it's written in, in a lighthearted vein. And that's what I hope to, to convey in, in the book as well. It's just this humanity and humor, that's the best way to counter um, the demonization. But let me respond a little bit about that review. He says that I should draw a distinction between the Chinese government and the people. Yeah, well, that's not so simple, right? I mean, an earlier you know, um, person mentioned that there's over 90 million members of the of Chinese Communist Party. I mean, it's basically, the, it's, who are they? I mean, they're, it's, it's selecting the elites, or to use a pejorative, we're like co-opting elites from diverse sectors of society. And you know they represent people too. And according to surveys, I mean there is substantial support. So I'm not so sure that it's it's easy. I mean it's, it's so it's so weird. It's like sometimes they pull me aside and say, Dan, do you support the Chinese Communist Party? I mean it's like going to an American and saying, you know, hey uh, Joe, do you support the American constitutional system? I mean it's like, what does that mean? I mean it's there, and you know that's part of it, and it's. It's not just one ruling organization. It's not going to collapse in the foreseeable future any more than the U.S. constitutional system will collapse in the foreseeable future. We, so that, that, this distinction between the people and the, and the party, I mean, I don't, I don't really think it's a, as, as, you know, as rigid as, as the reviewer implied. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, and yeah, go ahead. just my interaction with almost all the leaders at the university were, were, were party members. And, I really admire them. I mean, they spend almost all their time really working very hard for the university and for the students and the teachers. And during COVID, I mean, they lived on the university full time almost, you know, separated from their families. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not so, it's kind of, some people say the Communist Party is bad and the people are good. I mean, that's so, that's such a strange way of looking at it, I think. But anyway, yeah. Um, yes, over here. Thank you, Professor Dorothy Chen. Um, first of all, congratulations. Your book is not red in color because there's a theme among all the Chinese books being published in the U US and UK, which always have red in it. So well done. Um, and um, actually, my, I, I would like to hear a bit more about your interactions with the students because um, there's a lot of, um, well, I think being outside of China for a few years now, there's a lot of perception that you know, the students are great. They can do certain things very well. I'm curious about more on their um, creativity, um, their problem-solving skills. Because as, as you mentioned, we're going into a new world where there's a lot more AI and um, other things. And are they, like, are they prepared to help us tackle some of the big challenges? Well, so the students at Shandong University, to get into Shandong University, you have to score very, very high on the Gaokao, the national examinations. Actually, it's harder to get into Shandong University if you're from Shandong province, then if you're from Beijing applying to Tsinghua, there's a kind of negative affirmative action, you know, and if you're from Beijing or, or Shanghai, it's easier to get into the top university. So anyway, great students. Um, what does that mean, great? It means that they have amazing memorization skills, like top level analytical skills. Um, and when it comes to like we did seminars on Xunzi, you know, who's you know a great Confucian thinker from the Warring States period, and they had all read the first chapter in preparation for the Gaokao for the national examinations. So we could just assume that they had like photographic memory of, of that part of the text, and then we could we could uh, we could discuss it. Now sometimes they're a bit shy. So so what did I what did I deal with that? It was a small seminar. I asked them to submit six questions about the text each time we read a little bit two questions that two parts that they agreed with, two parts that they disagreed with, and two parts that they didn't understand, and then I would structure it according to their interests and preferences. And we had wonderful discussions. Whether those skills translate into this new kind of post-AI world, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm very, very impressed by the students that, that I'm engaged with, yeah. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. We have one here. Uh, yeah. Just, um, hi, I'm Elise, I'm a psychotherapist. I just wanted to know, following on from that question, a sort of a compare and contrast of the students there and the Hong Kong U students. So, um, I taught at Hong Kong U many years ago, and it, it was different. So now I teach one course on justice, and 
probably you should ask my colleague Marco, who's sitting to your left, because he has more experience. Almost all my students are from mainland China. That said, I have some, you know, there's who who, are, who represent diverse sectors of life. You know, some work on human rights issues. You know, one is a police officer, one is a pilot, and and there's great diversity. They're all graduate students. You know, and I'm so, so also excellent. Um, um, I'm not sure how representative they are. Yeah. But one thing that makes me sadden a little bit is that I'm told that there's not much social interaction between the students from Hong Kong and the students from mainland China. I hope that that will change in the future. Uh, Kim Ming. Uh, thank, thank you. Liu Kim Ming, uh, Associate Governor of the club. Uh, for those of you who have read the book, you would appreciate my question. For those you have not, I encourage you to read the book and you get a full picture. Are you still dyeing your hair? Thank you. Well, thank you. Kin Ming is a friend and he sent me an email last week about this issue. So yesterday I did go to dye my hair. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> So that's one of the things about mainland China is that men dyeing hair is not viewed as like a bad thing, you know. But I know in the West it's supposed to be, oh, women dye their hair, but men are supposed to be like macho and whatever. We don't worry about that. Um, any, uh, yeah, Lee? Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, Lee Williamson, a correspondent governor here at the club. Um, you mentioned earlier the two Michaels, your countrymen who were detained during the the Huawei investigation and that wider fallout. Since you've been working in mainland China, as you'll be aware, um, China has expanded its anti-espionage laws to go beyond um, documents data. It now includes documents data materials or items related to national security and interests without specifying exact parameters. I'm wondering if you can give me an indication of how much that has changed the game for foreign national academics in China, um, is that a concern for oh. others that are still in mainland China and, and academic freedoms there? Thank so you. This, this happened after I left, and uh, so I can't really, I don't have detailed knowledge. But of course, I mean, I think there's many things wrong in China, but one of the you know, things that are really worrisome is that you could just sink into a black hole, you know, if you fall on the wrong side of the law. In that sense, I do hope that Hong Kong and its commitment to the common law even though things are not as great as before, but we, I hope we could maintain that. Uh, let's do uh, one last question here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bell, for joining us. I'm Vincent Lee, uh, associate member of, of, the, of the club. So as a Confucian scholar, um, I just want to ask to what extent do you think the current ruling government in China uh, follow the Confucius idea? Because uh, it has been like, um, so I'm a history major uh, when at back at university, and uh, all the, um, the Western um, uh, academics would, would think that, you know, the, 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 past, um, the past decades uh, or, or centuries, the, uh, the, the Chinese governments have been following this Confucianism. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering, what's your, what's your take on uh, the current uh, Chinese administration? Like, how do they adhere to or differ or stray from the... Uh, Confucianism. So, thank you. I mean, so there's two main political traditions in Chinese history, as you know, right? One is Confucianism and one is legalism, fajia, sometimes tra translated as realism. And Confucianism more emphasizes like decentralized government, commitment to the family, you reliance on self power, moral example, um, education, and whereas legalism is this idea that in times of chaos, we need a very strong centralized government that is, you know, relies on, 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 on fear and, and punishment to, to control people. And these two tendencies have been constantly in tension throughout Chinese history. And, and now, arguably, you know, it's not necessarily as kind of the Confucian times. And so one of the chapters in this book is about the anti-corruption campaign, which relied heavily on legalist means, right? It was fear of punishment. And, and that, and that, but that has really negative consequences because it makes the lower level public officials much more conservative and con cautious and, and not willing to innovate and experiment. Whereas in the past, that was part of China's success, right? Including myself when I was dean. I mean, it was so frustrating in the beginning because we had to, every single item that we ordered, we had to have a list and so on. And, 
And at the end, fine, I'm just not going to go out anymore. Just too irritating, you know, to, to deal with all this bureaucracy. So, and so, th so the anti-corruption drive and the emphasis on legalist means led to this consequence of, you know, almost like semi-paralysis of the bureaucratic apparatus and also lots of enemies in the political system, right? Because anytime you go after one person, there's like many people below them who see their prospects for promotion being diminished. Um, so literally there's hundreds of thousands, if not more of, you know, like, enemies within the political system and it makes the leaders more paranoid. So it's this kind of vicious cycle. But I think now, of course, the anti-corruption campaign is becoming more targeted on maybe now on particular sectors of the economy, but it's loosening up, at least in academia, as I saw, which is a good sign in the future. So I think the more there's reliance on, you know, we can, to use this term, soft power, um, Confucian style soft power, um, I, I think we could move, um, well, we can reduce the disadvantages of the anti-corruption campaign, yeah. Well, I think we have to stop there as we're out of time, but thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It was very interesting. Um, yeah. Thank you.